Legend, cattleman, outlaw, clansman, Jacobite, latter-day Robin Hood. Rob Roy was many things to many people, but I'm going to break him down into one man with three lives and what made him change from one to the next. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then hit the subscribe button at the bottom right hand side of the screen anytime and click the notification bell to make sure that they tell you when I bring out new videos. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. Now Rob Roy was the younger son of a Dunyu Asil of Clan McGregor. He was born at the head of this loch. Glen Gyle is at the western end of Loch Catron. You could treat yourself to a boat trip from Trossachs Pier here to Stronachlachar, then walk to the top of the loch. Three miles to the west is Loch Lomond, seven miles to the south is Ben Lomond. Ben Lomond is the first Munro that you come to in the Highlands. Now, for foreigners, our mountains have been classified so that all those above 3,000 feet are called Munros. The point is that this is border country between Highlands and Lowlands. Here they spoke Gaelic. Ten or so miles that way they spoke English. These were a martial people who carried weapons to protect themselves. They were farmers who carried scythes and lawyers who carried pens. And the military and the state was their protection. Now it'd be a gross oversimplification to say that down there there was arable land and up here was cattle country. So let's just say that up here there was cattle country and down there there was arable land, but they had some cattle as well. And no weapons. Easy pickings. So let me show you Rob Roy country. Loch Lomond. The McGregor clan were prescribed, banned, persona non grata. Now I'm going to make a video about that and there'll be a link at the end as always. But if I was going to be prescribed anywhere, I think this would be the place. Anyway, let's focus on Rob Roy's first role as a cattleman. Highlanders reared Highland cattle. Lowlanders ate beef. Now, obviously, they couldn't come up, put a cow in the roof rack of a camper van and then drive back down south. Not with COVID restrictions. So you need men like Rob Roy, cattlemen. Perfectly positioned on that border, he spoke English and Gaelic. He could use a sword on this side of the Highland line and he could use a pen on that side of the Highland line. He reared cattle and drove them south to market each year. But more than that, he'd collect other folks' cattle and drive them with his own. Traders in the south would commission him each year to deliver a certain number of head of cattle. He'd source them up in the highlands and then he'd take them south, receive payment and duly pay the highlanders whose cattle he'd sold. He was like a cowboy clansman. Yee-haw! He was a businessman, and it seemed a successful one at that. But he was still a McGregor. Sometimes, lowland cattle went missing. So Rob Roy offered a service to protect the lowland farmers from cattle theft. They paid him rent, and he made sure that their cattle weren't stolen. Now, the Gaelic word for rent is mal. And the Gaelic word for black is do. Black rent, mal do. Or as the English speakers called it, black male. He reared cattle, he traded cattle, he protected cattle. He stole cattle. But to a Highlander, lifting cattle wasn't thieving. It wasn't like stealing sheep. The point is, as he carried out role number one, business was booming and life was good until it wasn't. Rob's business was under strain throughout 1711. He took orders and payments for much larger numbers of beasts than normal. He even took orders right up until April 1712. But that springtime, there was no sign of cattle, not one single cow. And in spite of bold words, Rob didn't seem to have the money to repay his creditors. Now, this wasn't the first time that somebody had got into financial difficulties or even bankrupt. And some arrangement would be made that he could continue, if not quite in good standing, then at least walking with a slight stoop. 
Neither was it the first time that cattle had gone missing in the hands of a McGregor. But this time was different. You see, in the winter of 1711, before the outside world realised the crisis that spring would bring, Rob Roy had transferred his assets into the names of friends and relatives without registering the transfer in Edinburgh. That would raise suspicion. He'd taken cash and issued bonds which had been transferred on to others, leaving them with the liabilities. No, this wasn't like other collapses for two very important reasons. The first reason was that Rob Roy hadn't come south and lifted lowland cattle at the end of a sword. It was far worse than that. He'd plundered lowland bank accounts with a Highland pen. Secondly, the victims weren't ordinary folk who could suffer all sorts of losses and the world would keep turning. The victims included the Duke of Montrose, a politically powerful noble who owned lands south of Loch Lomond, Dumbartonshire, Stirlingshire and townhouses in Glasgow and London. This was a man who'd been raised to the level of a duke as a reward for his parliamentary support for the Act of Union in 1707. I thought you'd say that. Rob might have expected to negotiate one of those reductions in debt in Lewis settlement. You know, the ones they advertised in the telly. And then he would have gone back to trading. But the Duke of Montrose made it his business to humiliate himself by being outsmarted by Rob time and again, making a famous hero out of Rob and an infamous buffoon out of himself. Other political opinions are available. Your social standing can go down as well as up. Now, there were three men of great position and power around at the time. The Duke of Montrose was to the south of Loch Lomond. To the north and the west were the Campbells of Glenlyon and the Campbell, Duke of Argyll. And to the north and the east was the Duke of Athol. Now, each was king in his own clan lands, and Rob played one political rival off against the other, thus escaping justice from any. Rob was now firmly established in his second career, Rob Roy the Outlaw. Now, there are stories of his capers too numerous to mention, but I can recommend the book The Hunt for Rob Roy. There's a link in the description below, obviously. Now, my favourite story is when he escapes from imprisonment under the Duke of Athol, only to find that the Duke of Montrose has sent troops to take possession of Rob's own lands. So Rob went all the way south to Montrose's Buchanan Castle, and he stole 30 of the Duke's best cattle from under his nose. Oh, the indignity! Troops were sent out to chase him, and they followed him back up here to his home country and commandeered houses for the night, leaving Rob Roy and his men out in the hills. But the next day, they found to their disappointment that Rob had returned back to the unprotected Buchanan Castle and emptied 16 balls of wheat from the Duke's grain store. But he did leave a receipt for the grain as payment for the rents that Rob had lost while the Duke took his lands. Of course, the tenants on his land continued paying rent to Rob Roy whilst pleading poverty to the Duke. But Rob Roy was still an outlaw. So when Queen Anne died in 1714 to be replaced by the Hanoverian George I, Rob Roy's third role was almost inevitable. Rob Roy, the Jacobite. Now, if there was an uprising and you were an outlaw, you certainly wouldn't take the government side. Now, don't get me wrong, Rob Roy's recorded as a youth as being at the Jacobite side at the Battle of Killiecrankie in the first Jacobite uprising. Incidentally, I've got a really popular video about that. Folks really enjoy it, and surprise, surprise, I'll leave a link at the end. But now, Rob took a prominent role in the Jacobite agitation of 1715 that ended at the Battle of Sheriff Muir, although he didn't quite make it to the battle. He was at the Battle of Glen Shiel during the Jacobite rise in 1719 that doesn't really get talked about. But if you ever pass Elendonan Castle, you'll see that it's always swamped by tourists. It's a stunningly mystical castle in that beautiful setting at the junction of Loch Duich, Loch Long and Loch Alsh. But the thing is that the current castle wasn't built until the 1920s. 
You see, when Jacobites took control of it along with Spanish troops in 1719, the British Navy came up Loch Alsh and bombarded them. After the Jacobite loss at the Battle of Glen Shield that followed, and to prevent the castle and supplies falling into British government hands, the job of blowing up the gunpowder, stores, and the castle with it was given, you've guessed it, to Rob Roy. The life of Rob Roy was far too eventful to cover in a short video. As I say, if you want more detail, you can read The Hunt for Rob Roy. The link's there. Eventually, he threw off the title of outlaw and settled here at Balkida, just over the hill from his birthplace where we started. But he was still no stranger to disputes, and his quarrelling continued to the end. At the age of 63, Rob Roy fought a duel with a young Stuart of Appen man. Now there are various stories about the cause and nature of this duel, but one tells that after much drink, they teased each other about whether the Stuart of Appen's father was worse for his poor performance at the Battle of Sheriff Muir, or Rob Roy was worse for not making it there at all. Things got heated and it ended in a duel the next day. They say it was the first of more than 20 duels that Rob Roy fought that he ever lost. Now he didn't die in that duel. Highland duels were to the first cut, but he did suffer a cut. And gradually, as the days went on, infection took over. He probably died of septicemia in his bed on the 28th of December, 1734. He was buried here in the kirkyard at Bulkida as they played McCrimmon's Lament. Now, if you don't know the story of McCrimmon's Lament, let me know. I'll maybe make a video about that. I'm certainly going to make a video about why the McGregors were outlawed. That should appear down there. Until then, why not find out about the Battle of Killer Cranky? That'll be there. And if you're ever passing Bulkida, why not come and pay your respects to Scotland's most famous Jacobite cattleman and outlaw. In the meantime, Hammy and Dawkins can be a lamb my life. Cheerio and Drastas.